Fantasy Baseball Neck, everybody. This is Austin, your dear friend, Austin. And what am I here to talk about today? Specifically, we're going to go over notable free agent uh, batters, notable free agent pitchers. Uh, we have some returns coming, guys coming off of the IL there, pretty significant. And as well, I want to uh, sort of highlight as well some uh, <clears throat> roster manipulation techniques, again, to get the most out of your uh, pitching staff, specifically in regards to the uh, Tampa Bay Devil Rays rotation. So um, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to look at the batters to start out. I have a lot of notes. This is going to be the uh, the bulkiest part, but I also think that it's fairly meaningful. Uh, batters and un uncovering a true value between uh, hitters compared to pitchers is very different. I feel like um, it's easier to kind of highlight the importance of uh, pitchers with their like basic box scores, but it's um, easier or harder to uh, uncover kind of the real value of hitters. Just looking at basic box scores, there's a little more uh, that goes into it. So let's start off with Christopher Morell of the Chicago Cubs. He um, is pretty much off to the same kind of start that he had last season. Super duper streaky hitter came off or like, made his debut last season um, between outfield and second base, similar to this year and um, started off super hot. So like he is a very, very capable of being a one through a one or two hitter. Um, and he was that <clears throat> for the Cubs last season, which made him a little more valuable than he is right now. He's currently kind of stuck at the sixth spot, uh, but he's hitting 358. Uh, batting average. He is um, also <laughs> averaging 2.88 total bases per hit and is on pace to hit 94 home runs this season, which will uh, not happen. Um, assuming that he has 550 at five at bats <clears throat> on the year. Um, I think that this is a guy that uh, obviously you have on your roster. He's already rostered by 56% of people. If this is someone that you've acquired over um, just the last couple of weeks. I think this is a pretty sell high guy. Um, he, again, he did this very, very similar, uh, thing just this past season. And then he basically, um, went on one of the coldest streaks that you could possibly have and, uh, was universally dropped across all of the leagues. So, um, a guy that's very capable of stealing bases as well, but, um, it's been super duper like unsustainably good for uh, his period up with the um, Cubs over his first 53 at bats to start the year. So again, he's averaging almost a triple per hit that is not possible to sustain, uh, but we will observe the rest of the season. So do what you will, but I think that he is a pretty solid uh, trade candidate right now, given the law of averages. Uh, next, and I talk about streaky hitters, Lord is Lord as Real Jr., is for sure the streakiest hitter in my lifetime of observing baseball. Usually he starts out super duper slow every single season and then works his way up at white hot to like end the year. And this is a career 333 batting average guy. But like the thing was when he was in Toronto all those years, um, it was just very well known that like, I think this is guy, this guy is going to be super duper productive as long as he's allowed to play every day uh, and get a whole season in. And so 2020, he more or less became a, pretty a full-time player and then or no 2021 he became a, like a no no sorry guys 2022 was the first time uh, this past season that he was allowed to um play full-time and get everyday reps and then actually ended up losing kind of a starting position Whit Whit Mirfield was traded for and sort of uh Lord has moved to the bench after this last season but across his career again he's a 333 average guy and he has been a guy that's uh, been a 30, 30 plus home run pace dude his entire career so far. Uh, still a young guy. I think he's only like 27, 28 years old. But if we look at, and maybe he might be like 31. I, You know what? I forget. Let's like forget about the age sort of thing. I see that he was with Toronto for like six years, but I, you never know. These guys get pulled up at the 23 years old. They get pulled up at 26 years old. So there's a significant difference there. Anyways, let's go forward with the important information. The important information that I would like to uh, kind of focus on is so far throughout the season, um, he is hitting that 317 average number, which is actually below his career average. So like we can expect his overall batting average to actually increase throughout the year because that's what his stats have been over his career. But the thing is, um, last season he hit for a solid 297 again, but for, for uh, through 500 or so, sorry, 453 at bats hit 297 this past season for five home runs, which is just again, falling on his face. He like uh, all of his career seasons leading up to last year again the narrative was this whatever this guy plays he's super productive but he just doesn't have a spot in that toronto uh offense as soon as they make 
uh, make a space for him, and he they clear out a space for him to play every single day. Falls on his face, still has a super high uh, batting average, but just didn't hit for any power whatsoever. Ended up uh, actually getting transitioned to the bench, like we said before. But in 2023, so far this year, he is averaging 1.75 total bases per hit, so a f- super volume guy. 167 at, at bat so far this season, which is every bit of an everyday player to start out this year, this early on um, he's on it on pace to hit 26 home runs. He's been on pace to be a 30 home run guy several times uh, throughout his career as a platoon guy. Um, and he's again, averaging at 317 average. So we can, I, this is a player that I expect to um, increase like to uh, progress throughout the rest of the year. Um, especially if he can get, he can weasel his way into the top of that lineup with uh, the Arizona diamondbacks. I think that, uh, that he has a really good shot to continue this pace. So I think this is a very sustainable player given, the numbers in the past um, and the fact that the Diamondbacks are uh, a half game out of first place from the Dodgers and the Dodgers pitching staff just completely falling falling apart not scoring runs like they were well they'd never be able to score as many runs as they did last year because that was a super team but um, you know they're not necessarily underperforming they're just saving up to pay Shohei Otani and then they'll you know ruin the league again uh, moving forward but again Lourdes Goriel Jr., though he's only rostered in 63% of leagues, he is ranked as the number four, uh, let's say, right fielder um, of available right fielders. And I think that he's a pretty sustainable option to um, to keep keep a hold of or add if he's somehow still available. Um, Next, I want to talk about Jorge Soler. We know Jorge Soler between his uh, career at the uh, Royals and then even to the Braves and now. Now with the uh, Miami Marlins, he is a super high strikeout guy. Um, Once he gets a hold of a ball every now and then, um, you know, it goes places. But I think the significant important stat with Jorge Soler to start out this year is he is actually hitting above 250. So like he, I think he's uh, his average at two, is it 250, 251, right? Skipping right above it. He's had a really, really hot last couple of weeks. Um, But if we look at Jorge Soler right now across all of Major League Baseball, he is 12th in total bases. So as an individual uh, taking out the concept of uh, stolen bases, just how productive are you at the plate as an individual? He's 12th overall in all of Major League Baseball, and he has an NL leading 14 home runs. He's on a 43 home run pace. So again, Jorge Soler um, is still somewhat uh, diabolical to you. If you are, if he cools down at all with the strikeout rate, he ends up being kind of, um, a diabolical kind of in a way of like Kyle Schwarber, except Kyle Schwarber walks a lot more Jorge Soler. If you're in a league that does not penalize you for strikeouts, then Jorge Soler is an easy, absolute guy, uh, to add to your roster. And he's only owned in 24% of leagues across the nation. So I think again, he is the number four ranked guy at his specific outfield position. Um, as well. And I think that that's pretty sustainable again, as long as you have a league that does not penalize you for strikeouts. He's a home, like a home run, uh, the cliche anyways, but, uh, Jorge Soler, that's why I think about him. Like if he's available in your leagues, I'd really consider trying to find a roster spot for him. Um, if you do get minus one point, uh, like a minus one against you for his, yeah, his 50 strikeouts this year. You can see how much uh, his peers have racked up. All of Josh Jung has beat him in that uh, category of just these guys that we're looking at so far. But again, like even if he is, um, you know, losing uh, one point per strikeout, just the fact that uh, so far this season, he is on a 43 home run pace. Uh, he will far you know, surpass that negative threshold per se. So let's go on to the next person. Try to make this quick. It's impossible. It's probably gonna be a 40 minute video, but we will see on to estuary. Uh, Ruiz, uh, one of the fastest players in baseball. Um, the only players I think that had a faster sprint speed than him was Michael or uh, uh, Bobby Witt Jr. and Corbin Carroll so far this year. Um, he is currently on pace to steal 82 bases. And with all the goofy stats that I always tell you guys about, like on pace, kind of like um, uh, conceptualize how productive they are in these small samples. This is probably the most uh, realistic one of all of the stats I've given you so far. So obviously again, like I mentioned before, um, Christopher Morell is not going to hit 94 home runs this season, but the, every stat would lead me to think that Eshuary Ruiz is going to steal 82 bases first off, because he is, um, you know, he's hitting, it's a solid 280, 300 over the last, um, just a uh, week, week or so. He's actually into his third or second, uh, major league season with, uh, with his third team, uh, he was traded partway through 2022 from the Padres um, and then ended up now he's with Oakland, but he gets on base a lot. Um, doesn't necessarily walk a ton. He only has I think eight walks on the entire season, 
But the thing is, is that he's only averaging 1.32 total bases per hit uh, for the season. Like, obviously, that's a guy that, like, traditionally I would not recommend because that just means he's a single machine and he's super we're dependent on his teammates around him. And if we can think about it, a good offense in all of major league baseball, you would, you know, where it's not the elephants uh, in Oakland, uh, they're actually probably the worst defensive team in all of major league baseball. But the fact that he's getting the most at bats um, on that roster, if you think of a Marcus Simeon as a staple gets the most at bats more than in plate appearances than anyone else in major league baseball, the same concept with the A's, he is going to have the breaks beat off of him. He's going to play every single day and just the overall sheer volume hitting at that 280 average. If he can sustain that, I, I imagine that he, he will given that he's a, uh, he's a right-handed hitter smacking, you know, pulling the ball towards third base. He's beating throws all of the time when he gets on base. And because he's not hitting for a lot of extra base hits, he only has one home run on, on the season. Um, because he's not getting on base, like on uh, a ton of extra base hits, um, he's actually getting on base as that leadoff hitter with no one in front of him. He's stealing bases at a 41% uh, rate when he just gets on base in general. So including his hits and his uh, walks overall, how many, how often is he uh, stealing bases? And I actually forgot to take out the uh, home run and the triple that he actually acquired. So I assume that he wasn't going to steal home. Uh, he actually has a 40, a, more than a 41%. Um, every time volume rate of stealing the base every time that he gets on. So uh, I think this is a guy that's super duper sustainable. He's just faster than his peers. And with the, uh, this, the concept of the pitch clock and the anticipate anticipation um, of that clock winding down, it just seems like it's too easy for him uh, to continue taking the, taking those bases. And it's not someone that they're going to uh, resign for any amount of uh, things. So like, if you think of those players that are uh, those teams that are super small market, like the A's, um, every good player that they have come through that uh, that lineup is a, a trade piece for the future because they're not going to re-sign anyone to any for anyone any amount of money. So what they're going to do is they're going to play Eshue Ruiz every single day in that leadoff spot. They are trying to get trying to get him as many steals as possible, driving up the trade value uh, that he will have in just a couple of years so that they can make as much off of him uh, and re re recycle, rinse, and repeat. And that's kind of how you have to look at it. No matter how far out of the race they are, they're going to continue to try to um, buff up everyone in that roster stats who has any sort of uh, value because they're going to inevitably trade them away. You look at a Matt Olson, uh, Marcus Simeon, uh, a Max Muncie, all these guys that were on that roster, even just like not too long ago at a co competitive roster. Why do you think that they threw Liam uh, Hendricks from the eighth inning through the ninth inning as often as they did? because they wanted to show off how important he was to inevitably trade to the White Sox for more prospects. So always keep that in mind when you are um, uh, taking on an A's player. It's the athletics of all of the teams in baseball. I always have a lot of athletics because you just, there's just no um, sense of um, uh, there's no disregard for their bodies. They have to get the most out of them because they have to be trade pieces. So if you keep that in mind, uh, athletics players are actually a lot more valuable than uh, perceived by most of uh, the fantasy baseball community. So done with estuary Ruiz. Uh, on to Owen Miller. So Owen Miller, Started off super duper hot. It was a 290 hitter, uh, pretty much like for the beginning of the season with the Indians. And the second that he started to like go through a little bit of a cold spell, he's just sort of a platoon guy from that point on. He had a first base and second base eligibility last year, uh, carried that into this year and actually gained third base eligibility and is on his way to gain uh, outfield eligibility. So he's had five starts in um, one of the outfield spots, and then he's had actually three starts in one of the other outfield spots. So if he has five uh, right field starts and he has three left field starts, that doesn't equate to eight outfield starts specifically. He's going to have to uh, play in right field per se uh, five more times in, in order to gain the eligibility. But if you think of a guy who is eligible everywhere except for shortstop and catcher, that obviously adds a ton of value on top of the fact that he is hitting the ball every single day and playing every single day on top of in the end, they've rewarded him for his, his production. So he's hitting 346 to start the year. But he, as of today, he's been moved to the leadoff spot. They've rewarded him for uh, his overall volume and production. And uh, not a super high touted proud prospect, but this is what he didn't get to do in Cleveland. So it, while he was in Cleveland, he was playing every other day uh, today uh, as, as of right now with the Milwaukee Brewers. He is in the lineup every day and the fact that he can play let's say four different positions, three of them in the infield, and then eight, let's say five, like two outfield spots, uh, very, very defensive capable. 
across that lineup, he is going to find and niche his way into that lineup every single day with even the opportunity to slot into DH because that's always available. So Owen Miller, uh, somebody like that, again, only 8% owned across rosters. I don't think that he'll be owned for too much longer, just given the fact that like people are getting hurt left and right. And the fact that he's going to be um, show up on every single uh, uh player position category when people are looking to fill. Uh, He seems like a pretty easy guy to fill in the future, and especially the fact that he's going to be hitting now uh, the leadoff spot. Before he was in the leadoff spot, he was batting cleanup. So he is locked in, it seems like, to those top four spots in Milwaukee, and um, no one can tell me that there's necessarily a surefire guy in Milwaukee's lineup that is absolutely hands down better than Owen Miller because the offense is just like it's a home run or nothing offense. and you guys can make an argument for Christian Yelich, but he's just, he's not the same player that he used to be. So Owen Miller, I think that this is a pretty sustainable uh, locked in pick, even if he digresses to his 290 average, as long as he's in that, two, that, that, that top four spot and he's able to play everywhere. I think there's a lot of value in him moving forward. So Josh Jung, uh, Texas Rangers top overall prospect. Um, The only issue really with Josh Jung coming into this season was he struck out a ton uh, in the minor across the minor leagues and he is still striking out, but he is a Josh Jung that's hitting 273 on the season is wild given that he had, I think it was, he hit like a 2.11 total basis per hit across his uh, minor league career. This is past year with a ton of home runs so far. He's on a 33 home run pace. He's hitting 273. That's like unheard of for Josh Jung. I I told you guys in the the preview, uh, kind of, of shows like how much I think of Josh Jung. The fact that he's the sixth overall th- ranked third base, um, third baseman is super sustainable. People aren't grabbing a hold of him because they don't know who he is because he's like 23, 24 years old. But this is absolutely sustainable success because Josh Jung is the third baseman of for the future and on a roster that's the number one scoring roster, um, and off or a scoring roster in Major League Baseball as of right now. So, Josh Jung, we can assume. If he can, if he can hit anything above 250, regardless of his strikeout rate, he is just so strong as meant to be a 30, 40 home run guy, kind of like throughout his career. Uh, this is absolutely a guy that you should acquire. And the fact that you can just look over just over the last week or two, um, how much, how productive he's been every day, um, in that roster at the five spot with the Texas Rangers. So, um, t- Josh Jung, if he's somehow available again, it's wild, that he's only owned in 36% of leagues. I had him in my other league and had to end up like, um, he was the lowest guy on the, the totem pole. I ended up dropping him because he wasn't super well owned or known about. I thought in my league, he got scooped up earlier than I thought. Um, a little bit of a drop of the ball, uh, in that regard, but we'll be okay. So, Josh Jung, sixth ranked third baseman. He's not going to gain any eligibility anywhere else. He is their guy for the future, but is also going to play every single day. You can see 183 um, at bats to uh, begin the season. So, Josh Jung, he's he's a uh, he's a stud. Michael Conforto is the name that we uh, maybe you guys have forgotten about. I certainly did not, but Michael Conforto had a like a, a, like a 290 season, 25, 26 home runs, 24 home runs with the Mets his last healthy year. Didn't play a game of baseball uh, this past season with a shoulder issue. Uh, got signed to the uh, San Francisco Giants for a fairly a fairly lucrative uh, deal given how little he played over the last year. But uh, what you'll see in the box score immediately is a 219 average. And that's something that we for sure want to avoid technically. So we look at batters I've talked about that we want hitters that are uh, that are at least 240 or up. Anything below 240, um, they're just not getting enough volume, not getting on base enough to be uh, fantasy relevant and be on our, on our rosters per se. But I think what's important to uh, sort of note with uh, with Michael Conforto is that because he hits so many total extra bases, and I want to look at the more uh, more recent stats. Like Michael Conforto started off the year, um, he played for a couple of games on the injured list, played for like a stretch of games back on the injured list day to day. He just hasn't been super consistent. But now that we have like a pretty decent uh, sample size of data to see like what he's been and what he's been like what he's been able to do since he's been an everyday player and healthy. Uh, he's hitting 250, which is again t- 10 points above that number uh, that we need at the 240. Uh, but also he's been averaging total a uh, two two total bases per hit. So he's been averaging a double every time that he's gotten hit, uh, hit so far this year. And just the fact that obviously he's playing in a huge ballpark in San Francisco, but just 
overall volume of being in that position at the four hole um, and within their batting order, averaging a double per hit for so far this season and 250 as of late. I just think that this is a guy that um, you can be confident in um, kind of moving forward throughout the rest of the season. And the next guy I want to talk about is D Brian De La Cruz. So Brian De La Cruz, um, I think he, he's, he's, been on a lot of boards and he's only 9.8% owned, uh, but he is hitting for average, especially as of late. So 346 over the last seven days, but he, for the entire season is hitting 297. And this is a guy who has always had a pretty like solid contact rate. Uh, I had the imagination. I don't know what imprinted this into my mind, but I always thought that Brian De La Cruz was like a huge mammoth of a person. I imagined him being like this six foot five, 240 pound, just like super strong, big, like muscle guy. And I don't know where that happened, where that occurred in my brain because he's actually six foot two, 175 pounds, super contact guy. Um, and is just kind of expected on base, not super high sprint speed either. Uh, pretty middle of the line. I think he needs to gain some weight in order to be super fantasy relevant, but I think that this is just a guy to keep your, uh, keep your eyes on. I think that they're more, more, uh, higher ceiling guys available in the, the world of the, you know, the free agency pile. But I think that the second that this guy gets moved into the top three of the lineup, if he has an opportunity, he, he's a, he's a lead off hitter. He's a one or two hitter really. Um, yeah. His, his make and his mold is between, between that one and two spot. The second that he's able to get up there um, and just be able to have more and more volume, he only has 165 at bats on the season compared to what we even saw with Josh Jung at that five spot, 185 at bats on the year, uh, regardless of how much the Marlins are scoring, as long as he's in that one or two spot, he'd be valuable, but he's kind of a lead off guy stuck in that five hole. So not a huge believer in Brian De La Cruz only because, um, he's just, <laughs> he's skinnier than he should be. He's again, I I'm six foot two and, uh, I haven't been 175 pounds since I was like, and I think like seventh grade. So the fact that like, it obviously, and he doesn't have super high sprint speed. It's just kind of confusing. Like he needs to put on some weight. Uh, I'm not body shaming him by any means, but just like, I, I think this is a player to keep your eye on because he has super duper awesome contact rate, but just isn't the, uh, uh, the a guy I think that's like super relevant to have on your roster. But I want to talk about him because he is trending um, across all the boards, 7.4% um, increase over just the last um, week or so. So, um, obviously this person is not available to add, but I wanted to talk about the importance of Luis Robert Jr. And I mentioned it in my last, uh, my last video, if you had time to watch it, but Luis Robert Jr. Is the best trade for value in all of fantasy so far this year. So he is, has individually, um, acquired 102 total bases on the entire year. So if I get rid of, uh, Brian De La Cruz and I just add, um, Luis Robert to this list, and I go up here and I hit clear search, I can show you that on the entire year, it's it, internet acts pretty slow and I'm like streaming at the same time. I'm um, working through it together though. Batters, all people hit the total bases category. And we get down to, again, Luis Roberts. So of all, everyone in baseball, all of the hitters in baseball, he's fourth um, overall in total basis, measuring the individual volume production of a hitter. He is more productive than Shohei Otani, Marcus Simeon, Pete Alonzo, Rafael Devers, Paul Goldschmidt, down the line. But I like to point out just sort of the importance of why I'm highlighting him again. So far, even though he is fourth in all of Major League Baseball in uh, total bases, individual production. He's only scored 153 points compared to a guy like Marcus Simeon, who's like at the leadoff spot as well. So Mar Luis Robert and Marcus Simeon are both leadoff guys, but very different offenses. I think that Chicago White Sox have just been underperforming for the last year and a half, but he's at the top. They, they both are leadoff guys. Marcus Simeon has hit for, let's just again, two less bases, but there's 50 total fantasy points separating them. That's an inflated number, 202 points compared to 153. That's a super inflated number. That's not sustainable. The all, law of averages that they're going to begin to start to level out and come back towards each other. Uh, meaning that Luis Roberts overall fantasy production is going to increase because he as an individual just keeps killing it. Um, and Marcus Simeon obviously is doing super well as well, but he's putting himself into a position where his teammates are either on base, he is knocking them in to earn RBIs, or he is getting on base and or getting on base and getting knocked in at a way higher rate than uh, Luis Robert, even though Luis Robert's been more individually productive. So Luis Robert, I just think you, if you're, if you're smart, 
not if you're smart, everyone I'm talking to is smart, but what I would do and what I'm attempting to do is throw assets for Luis Robert uh, to try to kind of steal him away because he won't be this undervalued for long. So let's move on to the next set of pitchers. And I don't have any notes on my other screen for these pitchers, just more of like going to talk from uh, what I understand. Bobby uh, Miller is a top line rotation prospect is supposed to be the next uh, you know, uh, Walker Bueller volume guy, 200 plus innings. Like there's a lot of faith in this kid. Obviously he's not ever going to get to that in this season because he came up late. And also there's going to be a lot of pitch count restrictions with that, um, that roster, that rotation specifically in Dodger land is uh, very injured to say the least right now. But because of all of these injuries, um, Bobby Miller is going to stick in this rotation. You're, we're going to figure out who he is. And the fact that in his first uh, start, you know, five innings pitch, one earned run and, and an even strikeout rate. So like five strikeouts per five innings pitched. Uh, that's exactly what, what we want to see. The win obviously was a uh, bonus. So he's averaging right now 18 fantasy points per. But if, even if he didn't get the run support um, that he that he got and they say he didn't get the win, 13 fantasy points just as an individual taking away that win is super awesome and really good, especially because he only went across five innings pitch. So if he stretches that out into six innings pitch, seven innings pitch, we can see that like that number is going to only increase into the twenties, uh, assuming he's going to get run support and things. Um, you, you can see how easily that can inflate given that he's going to uh, be allowed to increase his pitch count and also um, uh, get more and more efficient per batter um, per se. And these are things that like we can't really uh, measure, but a kid who's coming up, he's 23 years old and that rotation, he's going to become more and more efficient. That's just assumed. Michael Kopic. I've always been a big Michael Kopic believer, uh, mostly because I watch a ton of baseball and this might be like something obvious to you, but if you guys can see behind me, um, it looks like it's that commercial, but like I watch baseball every hour that it's on. It's just passively on in the background as I work on other things. Um, I watched a ton of White Sox baseball last year and Michael Kopic was on all of my rosters. Super big believer in this guy. Watched over and over again, him be limited by a pitch count, but then also just like wild, weird things would happen to where he would like incur losses. Uh, he would get knocked out early, whatever. But it seemed like to me that he was a super productive um, individual um, with an even, right around an even plus strikeout rate. But like just... Again, over and over again, I would watch this player and just weird things would happen like that weren't necessarily like his fault. There'd be errors like the White Sox were a, a misery disaster last year. Obviously, it's, it's easy to see the record and associate. Oh, they didn't score enough runs, but defensively, they were horrible last season. And uh, I think Michael Kopic was one of the uh, main guys to like feel the hurt um, from that issue that he can't really control even with the shift. So Michael Kopic, what's really encouraging specifically with Michael Kopic going into this like age 26 year is super young guy, obviously, but over the last month, he has been allowed to get, uh, throw basically a, a, up to, um, a hundred pitches. He's surpassed a hundred pitches twice so far this season. And he's been averaging between 92 and 97, uh, pitches per start. Um, and this is kind of what it equates to obviously starting out the year, every single pitcher that is, that pitches outdoors, um, in the Northern <laughs> part of the United States. So we're going to talk about, and we've talked about this before, but like, you know, the, the guys in Boston, the Chicago players, the Reds players, everyone that's just like pe pitching in traditionally cold winter states. Um, I never, ever expect them to do super well to start the year. They have to warm up. Gripping baseballs is hard. So I really want to just look at the stats from basically like May up. And so we go from May 2nd up and we look at the earned run counts across these uh, across these starts. He's got one blemish at uh, four earned runs, but actually ended up, um, well, I got a win that kind of got bailed out there, but even to even take away that win, it was still a positive start. What's really, really awesome. And I want to focus on is just these last couple of starts. Obviously, yes, he was able to go eight innings pitched, seven innings pitched huge numbers over here, 38 points and 32 points, but the strikeout rate is wild as well as across, um, just 15 innings pitched only gave up one walk and three hits. He's really starting to figure things, figure things out. And the fact that he's only rostered in 29% of leagues, everybody always needs starting pitching. Uh, Michael Kopic was a, was a big prospect came out of the bullpen. He's only really been successful just as last year had some weird things happen to him to inflate his ERA and to be for, kind of forgotten about. And then his strikeout rate also kind of fell after, after he got hurt. But now that I'm seeing 57 innings pitch 60.
strikeouts as well. As long as we're warm the rest of the year, there's no more cold fronts coming in. I really think Michael Kopech is a guy to invest into. Taj Bradley. We've only really succeeded at the minor, major league level. He went back to the mine down to the minor. He got sent down to the minors after his uh, first couple uh, three starts that were um, uh, 16 points, 26 points, and 16 points. And uh, basically just got to the AAA, just was just throwing in fastballs, not even care. He's just pissed off that he got sent back down. I would be too. They're trying to manipulate his roster. But what's also happened to the Tampa Bay Rays uh, starting um, rotation, as well as a lot of teams in baseball is just complete decimated Rasmussen hurt owned them uh Springs hurt owned them and they're still waiting on um you know Shane Bass and even um Tyler Glass now to return to that roster so um what's good about like that the injury issue with Taj Bradley is that they can't really send him back to um back down to triple a he's going to get an opportunity to really like sink his feet in and they're going to have to eventually either trade him or pay him uh in the future so Taj Bradley is a guy that I absolutely um, believe in, and you should too. 24 innings pitched, uh, already has a plus 10, 34 strikeout number uh, with a really solid uh, ERA, even though he got barely knocked around the last round. Maybe he's got a 4-4 ERA, but again, he got brought back up to the majors. He hasn't had a normal schedule uh, since he was originally brought up, and um, this is a guy I think that's super easy to invest into. He's only owned in 25% of leagues going down to Dane Dunning. So Dane Dunning is kind of a confusing, um, uh, <laughs> kind of a confusing man to me. So he is uh, now just inflated up to just under uh, one walk slash walk and hit per innings pitch. So his what number is now at 0 0.98. He's kind of a confusing bird because uh, he has, really done nothing but succeed out of the bullpen and as a starting pitcher. So it's also to, like, it's important to understand that he just recently got put into the rotation because of injuries, just like everybody else. Um, but he has really done nothing but succeed, but this number, these numbers low 1.67 ERA. Um, it's a lot easier to, uh, to obtain that one, six, seven ERA. If you're coming out of the bullpen to start and then jumping in as a starting pitcher, we can think of uh, like Ranger Suarez with the Philadelphia Phillies going in from the 2021 to 2022 season. He was a starting pitcher who like came in with like a 1.26 or something like that. Crazy low ERAs because most of his time was spent in the bullpen uh, before he got a rotation spot that next season. Same thing with Dane Dunning, except the differences with Dane Dunning is that he's got almost 20 uh, less strikeouts than he has innings pitched. So it's just, you can think about that many more balls into play uh, scares me a little bit. And this, the fact that um, like he, he has the number one offense backing him. So obviously he's going to be, he's four and so far at the start of the season. That's nothing against him. That's always an asset we look at. We don't what prepare for it. We don't count on him getting a ton of run support, but I just think of like, as he starts to increase his volume, he gets into those, those fifth, sixth innings starts to get a little bit tired. He didn't have the movement before. So if he's not super precise with his location, he's going to start getting hit more and more. So as we can see just over the last uh, three starts, six innings pitched, six hits, six innings pitched, six hits, 5.2 innings pitched, six hits. So he's not getting hit uh, super hard, but he's also just not like putting that many, putting that many batters away um, on his own via the strikeout, which I think is super duper important um, to be a sustainable fancy um, person. So if you are a Dane Dunning owner, obviously I think he's going to be like, again, right in between that we can see, right? Like a 15, 13, 15 point range, but he's going to have to get a win um, and he's going to need to, I think get hit a little bit less uh, moving forward to uh, really be confident in him uh, moving forward. Tyler Wells before just recently, it was kind of a very similar situation as, Dane Dunning. So Tyler Wells, um, throughout the, just, uh, before this, this past Sunday, he was the MLB leader in, um, on base percentage against. So like the batters that have faced Tyler Wells so far, uh, throughout the season, um, up until his, um, up until his May 18th start, uh, batters against him across the league overall, um, in one stat, they'd had, they had a, uh, yielded the lowest on base percentage. So basically, he just doesn't miss. He doesn't walk anyone. You can see across just this entire month, um, all the walk numbers zero zero one 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 three one. Like it's just he doesn't put anyone on base. There's no freebies. Um, even though he's giving up a, a fair amount of hits or uh, not a fair amount of hits, like he's giving up a low amount of hits, like per his innings pitched. Um, he's also just not putting anyone on base. But the difference is, is like these weird, the, the, what happened that's weird with Tyler Wells over just the last couple of starts 
is though he wasn't going super deep in the games, five innings pitch, five innings pitch. We're looking at uh, 524 versus the Yankees and 518 versus the Angels. Um, gave up a, a, more hits than this, like than before. Gave up those earned runs that we weren't really used to seeing, but also a strikeout rate w- went through the roof. So um, obviously a super young guy a super control guy that we've known as um, kind of moving forward, but because he was able to get as many strikeouts as he did uh, throughout that, that game, even though um, he gave up those earned runs that we don't love to see uh, still had positive outings. And this is a guy I think that's like pretty sustainable given how that his he now is carrying right around an even strikeout rate, whereas before he was kind of like a Dane Dunning, not not 20 less strikeouts than innings pitched, but more around like 10 strikeouts less than innings pitched. Um, I think that he's a pretty sustainable option only because he just doesn't give up any freebies. We've seen guys like this in the past um, succeed, and I don't think it's any different with Tyler Wells, and it helps that the uh, Orioles have a ton of run support and are like an average age of like 26 across the board. So uh, Tyler Wells... Kind of, I, I believe in Tyler Wells and the fact that he's only, again, owned, he's been doing so well and he's still only owned at 57% of leagues. Um, I think people just like to like black out of their heads that the Orioles score a lot of runs. Uh, still think of the Orioles being the worst team in baseball. Uh, it, like ex- expected to be very last place last season and almost like made the playoffs and whatever. So Tyler Wells, I give him a thumbs up. Alex Diaz or Alexis Diaz with the Reds. Um, the Reds aren't winning a ton of games. They're not supposed to win a ton of games. They cut all the payroll. They're going to be awesome in 2025, but as of 2023, um, they are still just not going to be able to really compete um, because the pitching, no one's able to go past the five or sixth uh, inning with their starting pitchers. They're all, their entire pitching staff is 24 years old, 25 years old. Uh, but if we somehow – hit our way into a situation for like for a save the fact that you know 18 innings pitched um and he's already struck out 35 batters his k per nine is awesome uh he's just been super duper reliable this year a 193 era if he gets into the opportunity to get a save he is the man um and i think that he is you know, his position rank six overall for being how uh, being on the reds who don't win a ton when the reds do win they're close games and now alexis diaz is on the mound for those ninth innings so on to braxton garrett Braxton Garrett so far to start this year, he's been a little confusing throughout his career. I don't love that he's given up more hits um, than innings pitched really to start off his um, his short career, but he is also is a guy who gives up no free passes, does not walk anyone. So though his, again, his whip is going to be higher than uh, we'd like it to be. It's not that 1.20 uh, and below that we like to see. I do like to see that he just gives up no free passes. Um, and he's also a guy that's, um, super inconsistent from a strikeout percentage. He'll have a, uh, he'll have a game where he goes out there and five innings pitch strikes out eight, uh, goes out again, eight strikeouts over six innings. And then he'll have a weird day where he goes out and uh, it seems just like five, five innings pitch, three strikeouts. Uh, he's just kind of over all, all over the board from that consistency or inconsistent space. But I think just overall with his stuff, I've seen him do it between last year and this year. He has the ability to be that guy who goes out five innings pitch, strikes out eight guys, strikes out. I think he struck out 11 guys across just a five inning game last year. And that was the second I was like, man, this guy has a lot of stuff, but just not really a spot in the rotation. Now it seems like he's going to be a pretty consistent um, guy who gets innings because they have to get him innings. And um, it's just a guy to keep, keep your eye on. I think that he needs to improve his overall consistency of like keeping his ERA down. His ERA at 4.6 right now is not very good, but again, a guy to keep your eye on um, that I want to talk about because he is trending in the right direction at 5% over the last week or so. And Alex Lange, Similar to Alexis Diaz, just super shutdown guy. Doesn't get as many strikeouts as Alexis Diaz so far this year, even though he does have super awesome um, strikeout numbers. His, I think it was his, his um, slider and his changeup both have like the 99th percentile in baseball uh, and strikeout rate. So um, when he throws those pitches, people don't hit them. Uh, um, per se, but uh, overall for the entire year, 101.27 ERA and nine saves. I think that he, as long as the Tigers have an opportunity to win, it's going to be a close game. And Alex Lange is going to be on the mound for a similar guy, um, you know, as, as Alexis Diaz, just not going to get as much volume um, as some of those um, better team closers. But really at this point in fantasy baseball, there's just not many teams that have a set closer. Um, a lot of, so many teams are a closer by committee. Think about the LA Dodgers going to win a ton of games, but like if 
you know, uh, Evan Phillips is only going to be on the mound for, uh, let's say, half of those games that they win. He all of a sudden is not more valuable than Alex Lane. You look at Alex Lane's compared to Evan, Ellen, Evan Phillips, and you compare, like, what is the actual stats? Who's the more individually productive person? And you go with Alex Lane because that, that is the case. And he is the – Number one, going to be their closer walking out there uh, guy. And the fact he's only owned 28.7% of leagues. It's a pretty easy decision if he's available. And then lastly, uh, with pitchers, Bailey Ober um, did really, really well last season. Uh, he only got hurt, just more or less like kind of hit his p- innings pitch limit, and they transitioned him back to AAA. Really young guy, <clears throat> just under that strikeout rate that we want. So 35 innings pitch, only 30 strikeouts isn't, like, yeah, super duper, like awesome or hot, but also another guy that doesn't walk a ton, uh, just under one, uh, just under a one whip with a 0.99. Um, he was benefiting uh, pretty decently from wins earlier this year, but I just think that this is a guy I've seen him play enough where I think there's a lot of stuff there uh, to be sustainable. And the fact that he's you know, 2.55 ERA across his first 35 innings pitch, just think he's a pretty sustainable guy. And if he's available at 35, percent owned in your league, then I think this is a guy that, you know, you easily could have on your roster and depend upon once every five days. So on to the next tab. What are we at? Oh my God. Already 40 minutes. Wild. Okay. Um, going to the players that are returning this weekend. Uh, so Aloy Jimenez is a guy, one of the only guys in baseball who have the structural capability to hit 40 home runs, uh, 50 home runs per se. Um, if he can just stay on the freaking field, um, obviously he's not, super, he's not been super hot to start the year, but um, you know, this is a player who anticipate, you know, bringing him back onto your roster and don't necessarily sell low. Um, he is very productive. I ended up trading him indirectly for Shohei Itani, which was far worth it, but just be prepared that Aloy Jimenez will be coming back either this weekend or early next week so that you don't have to drop value to the free agency wolves. Manny Machado is ideally supposed to also return like at the end of this weekend. Uh, I mean, it's, it's May 25th um, coming in to around May 28th or, or right after into next week. Um, he's supposed to come back into the lineup in a fractured hand, um, nothing lower body, uh, it, no lower body issues. So that's the guy that we can obviously always depend upon to be a top 15 player um, in major league baseball as position. Also, we saw uh, Kim, the everyday would be the for everyday second baseman for the uh, Padres actually got carried off the field uh, today after fouling a ball into his knee. So if he misses a significant amount of time, um, we can expect, obviously Manny's going to play every single day, but we can expect um, Dixon and rough Ned Odor to fill in um, in that spot. And that's just something I saw because I saw it earlier when they were playing Washington. Um, as mentioned earlier, this is the time to trade Tanner Hawk. If this is a player, you know, if you have a league that um, forces you to keep relief pitchers, Tanner Hawk obviously isn't going to be super valuable because he's going to get moved to the bullpen. That's not the case anymore. They actually changed it and said that he is going to stay um, in the starting rotation. And they are finally transitioning Corey Kluber to the bullpen. He hasn't deserved to be a starting pitcher in a really in a long time. He was only allowed to throw like 70 pitches last year with, uh, with the Rays was his max that he was allowed to throw. Um, so super wind dependent guy um, got smacked around a lot this year. And uh, he's only 6.2% owned across leagues because his name is Corey Kluber, uh, 6.26 ERA. Anyways, he's moving to the bullpen. That's where he belongs. Uh, Garrett Whitlock comes back this this Saturday and has been a pretty dependable guy. If you have him on his roster, just make sure that you're trying to trade away other people or prepare for him to come back on Saturday so you're not having to drop uh, people, again, for nothing uh, to free agency. Tanner Hawk's going to stick into the rotation. I've always had a lot of faith in Tanner Hawk. They just have to have a lot of faith in him and just keep him in the rotation. He'll figure it out. He had one of his best, he had his best start of the season, though he didn't earn a win. Um, this just this past week against the Angels, six innings pitched, eight strikeouts across only three hits, one earned run. Um, you know, he shows signs of it, strikes a lot of people out. Um, his, even though he has less, he just like, <laughs> have a lot of faith in this guy. Just got to keep him in the roster to have things figured out. James Paxton has a big name similar to Corey Kluber. He, he still somehow carries weight from the Seattle days. He finally had a James Paxton day that I expected him to have. Uh, if we look at his last start versus the Angels, three innings pitched, five earned runs, um, and got ran out of the game with a negative eight points against him. If you have James Paxton, um, I would try to like tag him on to another meaningful player to trade. Um, he's only going to digress. Even though his strikeout rates um, have still been like really good. And un, un, I didn't expect this to expect 
it to be as good. Uh, but that is what's happened with James Paxton. But anyways, um, a player that I would get rid of as quickly as possible. Kyle Hendricks returns for the Cubs. He is a mercenary who is just going to throw a hundred plus pitches every single game. Um, he is a, a kind of a, a niche guy who's going to throw out like 84, an average of 84 miles per hour per fastball. Um, he is not going to be figured out by every single roster, but eventually he's going to get smacked around. He doesn't have the strikeout uh, potential of any of the guys that I've just talked about, uh, but he's coming back and he actually starts tonight for the Chicago Cubs against the Mets. I don't expect much from him. I don't think you should either. Uh, only 3.7% owned, but I wouldn't necessarily fall for the uh, trap that is Kyle Hendricks, the professor. Um, he's a location dependent guy but not worth keeping on your roster. Tyler Glass now also returns very soon. I think Saturday he's supposed to start for the Tampa Bay Rays. Don't expect him to throw more than 70 pitches um, to start the game. If you have a, a situation where, like, if you start Tyler Glass now and then lose your um, ability to start your pitchers on the uh, Sunday, I would – bench Tyler glass now just this first week and let him get his, like his 70 pitches in come in and then start him next week. Um, even though Tyler glass has been one of the most productive pitchers per innings pitched over the last year, like over the last year, since he's been in Tampa Bay, he got traded from uh, Pittsburgh to Tampa Bay. I think this is a player that is super special way above his peers, similar to a Jacob deGrom or a Spencer Strider production per, um, uh, per innings pitched, but no, ju no bad juju to Spencer Strider, but like just can't stay uh, super healthy. So look forward to adding Tyler Glass now to your roster. Um, you've waited this long. Congrats. He's going to contribute very soon, but um, be wary of his very first start because everybody's first start off of the IL um, usually doesn't go the way that you want it to. Jared Schuster down here at the bottom, uh, big prospect with the uh, Braves, had an opportunity to win it outright to start the season, got knocked around. Bryce Elder came in and he has filled in since, but with the injuries to the uh, Atlanta Braves, to both Kyle Wright and Max Freed, he's going to be left up there to figure it out. Across his last two starts since coming back up, uh, five innings pitched against number one offense in baseball, uh, the Texas Rangers, three in runs, <clears throat> pretty solid. Last start against Seattle, uh, Seattle Mariners, six innings pitched, seven strikeouts, one earned run. You can see the difference um, and the uh, importance of his run support and his situation. The Braves just seem to have it figured out. It seems like don't Jared Schuster with a 3% owned um Average before he was competing versus Dylan Dodd and Bryce Elder. And it was like, you know, if you do well, you can stay. Uh, but if not, you're going back. And I think the pressure, you know, getting to a kid that's 23 years old, that's what happened. Um, got sent back down. Now that he's back up, he's there for good. Um, he's really going to get an opportunity to cement himself into that lineup. And I think Jared Schuster is a, a pretty solid and sustainable pick moving forward. So um, <clears throat> I wanted to just look at the Tampa Bay rotation. So, you know, the only guys that are going to get any amount of uh, like pitch count really so far this year is going to be Zach Eflin's going to be allowed to throw as many pitches as he, um, as he really wants. And Shane McClanahan is obviously going to be uh, an AL Cy Young contributor, but then we get down to Tyler Glass. I was going to be super limited to start the season uh, or start, start his season. Josh Fleming, who is uh, traditionally an opener only goes, uh, no less than two innings pitched per start. And then Taj Bradley, who's going to be uh, limited at the only, uh, only the age of 22 is going to be limited um, in his uh, pitch count as well. So um, this is what I want to transition to understanding that context. So um, I just saw that Jalen Beeks is supposed to be the starter uh, in tomorrow's game against Noah Syndergaard. And the important context here is I have no interest in Jalen Beeks, but if you are a, uh, in a league that does not, penalize you for like, you know, for pitching essentially like in my one league, um, I, it's like impossible to get a negative, uh, negative points from a starting pitcher on average. My pitchers get between let's say, uh, 40 and 60 points per like, usually like when they go out there and have just an okay day. So if you're in that situation, uh, Cooper, Chris, well, is actually supposed to be the bulk reliever tomorrow, meaning Friday, 526. Um, he is going to be the bulk reliever and, uh, really have an opportunity, uh, to earn free points that do not count against you from a, a starting um, a start per se. So if I go over, yeah. So I see um, just this past week, 
I started Dylan Covey because I saw that Matt Strome was going to be the opener. So if I look down at Dylan Covey's uh, stat line, he went five innings pitched, uh, gave up one run, six uh, strikeouts, and actually got me 40 free points. But because he was a planned bulk reliever behind Matt Strom, so Matt Strom was the um, was the designated opener to go through the lineup the first time. Um, he pitched two innings pitched um, and actually gave up a couple runs, whatever. But Matt, uh, David Covey, Dylan Covey came in right after him and actually had the opportunity to earn a win if he would have had more run support um, and got 40 points, but it didn't count against me for my starters uh, from game started um, because everywhere, all teams are, uh, are limited in that regard. So if I look up um, just as an example, if I go to, Again, I, I, I show you guys this all the time, but just, just in case we have someone joining for the first time, I want to be inclusive. Uh, going down to see your box score, so say like I already have six pitchers um, start for the entire week. I'm a max allowed 10 before uh, I lose the ability to earn points on my starting pitching. Um, this is the situation that I'm I'm talking about with a Dylan Covey or tomorrow as in a Cooper Criswell who's going to be uh, guaranteed to throw around um, let's say four to five innings pitched. He's not a good player. Like we look at his overall ERA um, on the season. He's almost an eight, but if you're in a league specifically, again, that does not penalize you for um, getting knocked around, then it's free points. So just again, looking at his, five, his uh, May 21st, uh, bulk relief uh, outing in Milwaukee or against Milwaukee, 4.2 innings pitched, eight hits, five earned runs, and he still earned 17 points. So you can see the value of that. If you're in a league like mine um, that values, um, you know, just pitching in general by volume, you get rewarded regardless of how quality it was. So this is a list of guys that if you're looking through the probable pitchers of the next day, if you have a league that kind of fits this format, uh, these are names that you want to keep an eye out for. So if you see Jalen Beeks, uh, most of these guys are with the um, uh, Tampa Bay Rays because of the, you know, the rotation situation that I just mentioned. Um, Jalen Beeks, Cooper Criswell, Yanni Chirinos, Josh Fleming, Trevor Kelly is uh, has been an opener uh, just recently as well. Matt Strom opened uh, for the Philadelphia Phillies. They're using him all over the place. He's had save opportunities. He started. He's been one. Of, he's basically one of their best pitchers on roster, and they're just kind of using him how uh, they see fit. And then Dylan Covey was the planned bulk reliever after him. So why I'm saying again, keep an eye out on these openers. We don't want the opener, but I see Jalen Beeks. I know that Jalen Beeks is going to be the, uh, the probable starting pitcher of this next game. I'm going to click into to Jalen Beeks, um, you know, read up. I'm going to see that opener for Cooper Criswell and see that Cooper Criswell is going to earn or be able to reap the spoils of uh, coming in versus the bottom of the lineup, going through the lineup a couple of times, and then having you know the number two overall team uh, and run support with being the Rays, give him an opportunity to earn a win as long as he doesn't just completely fall apart. So that is the point of why I bring up uh, the openers and why I bring up openers two videos in a row because it has given me a significant advantage over my peers and i wanted to show you how like you kind of go about trying to find openers and like it's not something that people ever write articles on um, it's just sort of like something that you have to figure out how to finagle and find so what i did was i went to the um uh relief pitcher so go to your go to your players add players tab you're gonna come up you're gonna go click on relief pitchers you're gonna filter by all just to like just to, to bring everybody into um into the queue and then you're going to go over and hit total points and then you're going to switch important so you're gonna be from stats i'll just do it we'll, we'll do it together so we're gonna have stats open and it's going to look like this total points. And then I want to go over and hit eligibility. So the eligibility part is going to let us uncover um, these openers that like get an opportunity to again, open games. So um, I mentioned all the Tampa Bay players and the Philadelphia players that I already knew about, but I took the time to find two guys that I didn't know about that have actually also been used as openers recently, given starting pitching, starting pitching injuries and uh, issues and rotations. So um, going through, um, this I'm looking for small numbers. So like a, um, uh, the, the PP means that they came into the season as their, as that's their prominent position. And X means that they've already earned that. Um, whether they carried it in from last season or they've already earned it this season, they've earned that designation to be able to slot in to a uh, relief pitcher slot. So what I'm looking for 
is I'm setting it to, again, relief pitcher as the category, but I'm going down and I'm searching for um, starting pitcher, small numbers in the starting pitcher tab. And if I go through this list, I see all that I found were X's and dashes. Dashes means they don't have any any show, like, like Matt Moore has never come in this year as a starting pitcher. So he has a dash that means nothing. So I saw X's meaning that like Trevor Williams last year, uh, actually like he came in to relief pitch or uh, starting to start like five games last season. So we carried that into this year. But if I keep scrolling, I go to the second page, I run into a, oh, Jesse Chavez, one start at st- starting pitcher. He is traditionally a, a, a relief pitcher, has been a hold, a setup, uh, a setup guy for his entire career. Um, but now that Rossiel Iglesias has come back into the fold and AJ Mentor is still there, um, they're using him more creatively given how successful he's been. And if I click on Jesse Chavez and uncover um, just his first article, just this past uh, May 20th, so just five days ago, um, he was actually used as the open opener for the Braves given um, their situation. So the second you got, you figure out this information, if you go to find the openers, like I just found Jesse Chavez, then I can understand and um, uh, again, read in to figure out who's actually piggybacking with them. And I bring back, this is important to keep keep track of because a lot of these guys, they're trying to get these young kids in who have a lot of potential um, to get some solid innings in behind these openers, but they want them starting against the bottom of the rotation and working through. So I talk about um, how I was the first person I swear on the planet to be reporting that Spencer Strider is going to be the next ace for that roster. It's because I figured out that he was piggybacking with guys like Jesse Chavez but he was pitching almost 80 pitches per five days, but he was never starting. So he never popped up in that probable um, start, you know, uh, uh, function. He, he was never going to be found in the, um, the probable starters tab, but because he he was on that five day rotation pitching every single day or every single five days with an opener in front of him to sort of disguise it. Um, you can better uncover again, these guys that are, you know, crazy good pitching talents, uh, but sort of being brought in, uh, softly, uh, to again, limit their inning kind of passively and also sort of keep them out of the limelight, um, and the pressure and all of that jazz. So that's what I have to say about Jesse Chavez and uncovering, relief pitchers. Um, as I mentioned before, not really sure why. I ha- oh yeah. Um, so six innings pitch, this is kind of the importance of openers. Again, if you haven't caught on yet and they uh, like having to like these people play uh, in your favor. So, so far this year uh, or this week I'm playing against this person. I have six pitchers that have uh, started for me. So if I go to my team, and I understand that I scroll down and I see that uh, Lucas Giolito is pitching right now and Blake Snell is, has already pitched for me today. So I started out with six today. I'm now to seven, Blake Snell, eight, Lucas Giolito. I want to go up to the schedule tab and through May 28th. So May 28th is uh, the Sunday. I need to make sure that on Saturday, May 27th, that I do not sur- surpass nine starting pitchers. So if I go to um, uh, my number, knowing that Blake Snell again is number seven and Lucas Giolito is number eight, I can only have one pitcher go between May 26th and May 27th. So this gives me opportunity to understand that Hunter, okay, Justin Steele is going to start tomorrow, Friday, uh, May 26th. And then on the, I'm going to purposely let Garrett Whitlock start and stay on the IL on Saturday so that I can reap the spoils of Spencer Strider, Tanner Hawk, Christian Javier, and Bailey Ober all going on Sunday because I let them, I slow played it. But if I was to, again, uh, go after the, um, the, uh, the, 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 what's his F name, the Cooper Criswell for the Tampa Bay Rays, I could throw him in and potentially earn like another 40 points like I did with Dylan Covey, but it not count against that number. So it's like a free, it's, it's like a, it's like a free starting pitcher because it's a planned bulk reliever. That's the difference is like finding Jalen Beeks, realizing that he is a relief pitcher is not going to pitch more than two innings, uncovering the report, finding that, um, Cooper Questwell is going to be the guy that's actually going to pitch around five innings. He's going to have an opportunity for a win um, and succeed in this league. That's super niche and whatever. So I just wanted to like visually illustrate like what I'm going to do to make sure that I um, go into May 28th with only nine pitchers, because as long as you don't surpass 10, I'm only allowed to have 10. But if I go into Sunday at nine, I can have 10, 11, 
12 and 13 go and they all count for me because the the, um, the rules don't really um, adjust in real time they adjust um, at the end of day so that is the value of all of that jazz and uh, as I was watching the very end of the Padres and Nationals game. I saw that Kyle Finnegan, who's uh, traditionally been the closer for the Nationals the last couple of years, um, has actually now bumped to the um, setup role, which I thought was interesting. So Hunter Harvey is now uh, the closer and he actually came in to close today. He had a, a basis a guy on first and second and actually gave up a uh, home run that just barely squeezed uh, past the foul pole and right field for a homer to actually end up like losing. I assume losing the game. I didn't watch hater uh, close out because I started talking and somehow it's been over an hour that I've been talking. But anyways, Kyle Finnegan is no longer the closer with the uh, Washington Nationals. If you're desperate for saves, um, this is a player that you can drop and assume that Hunter Harvey is going to get those opportunities because Kyle Finnegan came in the eighth inning and faced the bottom of the order with the expectations of Hunter Harvey facing the top of the order in the ninth inning. So very clearly he has earned that spot. So that is the end of today's episode. I should probably break this into two, but given that I kind of uh, already provide you guys the chapters, um, you know, feel free to skip what you need to always throw my videos. And thank you again so much for the support. You guys are so positive in my life. I don't know if I would have kept up with it this, uh, you know, this long if I wasn't just showered with positive reinforcement all the time from a bunch of strangers I've never met before, but man, do, do I feel uh, loved and appreciated by all of you. So thank you so much for supporting me and I look forward to talking to you soon. Have a good weekend. Bye guys.